all right so a very good evening to all of you so as a part of the central exams test and discussion the today's topic is the connective tissue disorders so i'll give you a very important questions that will definitely appear in your aims exam related to your connective tissue diseases right so i am myself dr rajesh gubba i am the general medicine educator on this an academy platform right so now we will discuss the questions related to the connective tissue disorders okay now let me start with the first question which of the following hla is specific to rheumatoid arthritis hla dr1 dr2 dr3 and dr4 anyone very good sk rai right so you have a quick answer and uh, you have answered it very correctly the answer is hla dr4 okay rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder right it is an autoimmune disorder where you have the formation of the antibodies and the antibodies are of igm type of antibodies right the antibodies which are being formed as igm type of antibodies and uh, this autoimmunity is very common in those individuals who have hla dr4 association that is a very important point related to your rheumatoid arthritis we will move on to the next question right all of the following are seen in inflammatory polyarthritis except newborn formation spontaneous flare increased esr morning stiffness more than 1 hour yes uh, harshita says uh, yeah now yes harshita in case of diabetes mellitus that is type 1 diabetes mellitus you have hla dr3 and as well as dr4 both right hla dr3 and as well as dr4 where in case of diabetes mellitus okay right yes answering to this particular question all of the following are seen in inflammatory polyarthritis except very good so amulya and as well as palak have answered this and even vikram nikhil has also answered the answer is the newborn formation is not seen in patients with the inflammatory arthritis now you take this newborn formation this newborn formation is characteristic feature in case of non inflammatory arthritis right non inflammatory arthritis now what is the example of your non inflammatory arthritis that is nothing but your osteoarthritis right the example of your non inflammatory arthritis is osteoarthritis so in osteoarthritis you will have newborn formation whereas in inflammatory polyarthritis you will have the presence of a spontaneous flare and there will be also raised esr and there will be also presence of morning stiffness for more than 1 hour in case of inflammatory arthritis but newborn formation and what is that particular newborn the newborn is nothing but the osteophyte right the newborn is nothing but osteophyte and where do you see this you will see this in patients with a non inflammatory arthritis right an example of your non inflammatory arthritis is osteoarthritis right osteoarthritis so in osteoarthritis you have the newborn formation but not in case of the rheumatoid arthritis in case of rheumatoid arthritis what will happen is there will be bone resorption why because of the action of your inflammatory cells okay so that is about the story in case of the inflammatory arthritis example rheumatoid arthritis now you take the other question which part of the spine is most commonly affected in rheumatoid arthritis cervical spine lumbar spine thoracic spine sacral spine which part of the spine is most commonly affected in rheumatoid arthritis right very good sk rai so the answer is the now it is not lumbar spine harshita it is the cervical spine okay now if i ask you a question now which part of the cervical spine which vertebra of the cervical spine are affected in rheumatoid arthritis can anyone answer this 
because we have totally seven cervical vertebra out of this which cervical vertebra are affected in rheumatoid arthritis right so the cervical vertebra which are being affected is c1 and as well as c2 right c1 and as well as c2 okay very good skri so and what is this particular c1 and c2 the c1 and c2 is nothing but your the atlanto axial joint atlanto axial joint is the one which is most commonly affected in patients with the rheumatoid arthritis and they will have what is called atlanto axial dislocation right atlanto axial dislocation okay and because of this particular atlanto axial dislocation the individual can have quadriplegia right the individual can have quadriplegia or quadriparesis that is what you can have in patients with the rheumatoid arthritis okay right now you see another question very important a 45 year old coal mine worker present with the cutaneous nodules joint pain and occasional cough with dyspnea his chest radiograph shows multiple small nodules in the bilateral lung fields some of the nodules show cavitation and specks of calcification most likely these features are diagnostic of jogren syndrome kaplan syndrome silicosis wegener's granulomatosis so what do you think is the answer in this question okay so harshita says silicosis any other answer apart from silicosis no yes so the answer here it is kaplan syndrome hmm? it is not your silicosis now what is kaplan syndrome kaplan syndrome is right kaplan syndrome is coal workers pneumoconiosis plus rheumatoid arthritis right coal workers pneumoconiosis plus rheumatoid arthritis that is what is your kaplan syndrome now you see the presence of this cutaneous nodules and as well as the joint pain they are all suggestive of your rheumatoid arthritis whereas coal workers pneumoconiosis that will give you the presence of the dyspnea so in case of coal workers pneumoconiosis what is that you will see as the x rays you will see the presence of the necrobiotic nodules right you will see the presence of necrobiotic nodules in the chest x ray so coal workers pneumoconiosis and as well as rheumatoid arthritis this is what is called as the kaplan syndrome right this is what is called as kaplan syndrome and whatever you are seeing these nodules here hmm, these are all your the necrobiotic nodules right these are all your necrobiotic nodules which is suggestive of your coal workers pneumoconiosis right next we will move on to the next question yeah this is a very very important question type of anemia you will see in rheumatoid arthritis is microcytic hypochromic anemia macrocytic hypochromic anemia normocytic hypochromic anemia normocytic normochromic type of anemia yes what is the answer here right very good skri so skri has answered this first so the answer is normocytic normochromic type of anemia so normocytic normochromic type of anemia is a very important anemia what you will see in patients with the rheumatoid arthritis all right next okay now i will ask you a very important question related to rheumatoid arthritis what is the investigation of choice for rheumatoid arthritis what is the investigation of choice for rheumatoid arthritis yes and let me see who will answer this question first right so if you take the investigation of choice very good uh, shavik das so it is your anti ccp right so majority of you are under the impression it has the ra factor remember ra factor is not specific for rheumatoid arthritis ra factor is positive in many conditions and the investigation of choice in rheumatoid arthritis it is your anti ccp that is anti 
cyclic citrullinated polypeptide it is not the ra factor which is the uh, specific for your rheumatoid arthritis because ra factor is positive in many conditions so that is the reason why ra factor is not the investigation of choice next now this is another very important question related to your behcet syndrome behcet syndrome is characterized by all except myocarditis peripheral arthritis genital and oral ulcers thrombophlebitis very good so see the question as this all except right the answer here is myocarditis myocarditis is not the feature of your behcet syndrome see the characteristic feature or pathognomonic manifestation in behcet syndrome is recurrent after ulcers right recurrent after ulcers okay so this is the characteristic manifestation what you will have in patients with the behcet syndrome okay and after ulcers were in the mouth that is in the oral cavity right and followed by that the other important manifestation is the presence of the genital ulcers and they will also have the peripheral arthritis and they will also have venous and as well as arterial thrombosis causing thrombophlebitis right or thrombophlebitis leading to venous and as well as arterial thrombosis but the point is myocarditis is not the feature of your behcet syndrome okay so take this point very very important point okay now i'll just show you an image related to your okay i'll just show you that right most common organism associated with reactive arthritis is staphylococcus shigella chlamydia yersinia and this is one of the highly controversial question and i'll give you a best right so right see most of you right it is almost like half and half some of you are telling chlamydia and some of you are telling like shigella let me tell you it is the chlamydia that is the most common organism associated with the reactive arthritis now if you take this reactive arthritis reactive arthritis is the one which is characterized by a triad now what is the characteristic manifestation in the uh, triad that includes arthritis right and the second thing in the triad is conjunctivitis right and as well as urethritis okay so this is a triad in the reactive arthritis okay now the point that you should understand here is if you take this reactive arthritis this will occur secondary to gastrointestinal infection right this will occur secondary to gastrointestinal infection or it may occur following a sexually transmitted infection right following a sexually transmitted infection now secondary to gastrointestinal infection causing reactive arthritis the organisms are shigella and as well as salmonella right whereas secondary to sexually transmitted infection causing reactive arthritis the organism is chlamydia right the organism is chlamydia trachomatis right the organism is chlamydia trachomatis okay right so that is about your what is called as the reactive arthritis right next now followed by that yes now can anyone tell me what is this image in patients with the reactive arthritis there is also cutaneous manifestation right there is also cutaneous manifestation in case of the reactive arthritis now can anyone tell me what is this cutaneous manifestation in the reactive arthritis can anyone tell me what is this image in reactive arthritis right very good vasavi right so this is nothing but your keratoderma blenorrhagicum
right keratoderma blenorrhagica right so this keratoderma blenorrhagica what is this these are hyperkeratotic vesicles right these are hyperkeratotic vesicles which are seen in patients with the reactive arthritis right which are seen in patients with the reactive arthritis okay right yes now let me tell you ask you some of the questions related to your lupus sle sle is another very important topic in the connective tissue diseases most common drug leading to drug induced lupus is procainamide disopiramide propafenone propyl thiouracil yes very good harshita uh, right harshita and shovik das yes everyone are answering now the answer is the procainamide the most common drug leading to drug induced lupus is your procainamide right and uh, your procainamide it is an anti arrhythmic drug right anti arrhythmic drug which class of anti arrhythmic drug is your procainamide which class of anti arrhythmic drug is your procainamide yes which class of anti arrhythmic drug is your procainamide anyone right so it is your class 1a hmm? that is your class 1a right okay now following this particular question then we will move on to the other and very important thing is in case of drug induced lupus the antibodies are different what is that antibody it is anti histone antibodies right the antibodies like what we see in drug induced lupus is anti histone antibodies okay so that's a very important point that you should note down right now this is another very important question related to your sle features of sle include all of the following except recurrent abortions sterility coombs positive hemolytic anemia psychosis what are the features of sle included all except right so answer to this particular question here is right let me tell you coombs positive hemolytic anemia it is a feature of systemic lupus erythematosus it will be there and recurrent abortions this will be there as a part of your apla syndrome right this will be there as a part of apla syndrome in systemic lupus erythematosus whereas you take psychosis psychosis is the neurological manifestation right psychosis it is a neurological manifestation in patients with the systemic lupus erythematosus and what is that you will not have in patients with sle is the sterility sterility is not the feature of the systemic lupus erythematosus so it's a very important point please make a note of it right next followed by that yeah this is another very important question a 23 year old woman has experienced episodes of myalgia pleural effusion pericarditis and arthralgias without joint deformity this is very very important over the course of several years right the best laboratory screening test to diagnose her disease would be cd4 lymphocyte count erythro esr anti nuclear antibody assay for thyroid hormones right so remember ana anti nuclear antibody that is a best screening test in pay so now what is the diagnosis here the diagnosis of this particular patient is sle now why do you consider it is an sle see sle is very common in young females right and apart from that polycerocytes is very common in patients with your sle what is that polycerocytes pleural effusion and as well as the pericarditis and pericardial effusion so serocytes is very common in patients with sle and the other point is in sle the type of arthritis what you will have is non erosive arthritis right the type of arthritis is non erosive arthritis and you can see that there is no joint deformity at all 
And what do you think is the best lab test for screening? That is your ANA, anti-nuclear antibody, right? So anti-nuclear antibody, it is not only the best screening test. Let me tell you that this is also the most sensitive test for SLE. Right? This is also the most sensitive test for SLE. But whereas if the question is asked, the most specific test for SLE, what will be the answer? What is the most specific test for SLE? Right? Very good. So that includes anti-Smith and as well as anti-DSDNA. Right, anti-Smith and as well as anti-DSDNA. So these are, yeah, so these two are the most specific tests for SLA. And the most sensitive test is anti-nuclear antibody. And the best screening test is anti-nuclear antibody. Right, next. Yes, this is another very important question. Primary extraglandular Jogren syndrome is seen in all except Rheumatoid arthritis, Raynaud's phenomena, lymphoma, splenomegaly. Right, and uh, okay, so Shavik Das is asking me a question about the point of sterility. Now, let me tell you, Shavik Das, in case of SLE, as such, SLE will not cause infertility. But which patients of SLE will develop the infertility is if SLE, if it is associated with APLA syndrome, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, they are the one who are prone for the development of infertility, right? And what percentage of patients with SLE will develop this APLA syndrome? Okay, so it is only 50% of patients will develop this APLA syndrome. It is not all the patients who will develop this particular APLA syndrome. And only when the APLA syndrome is associated with SLE, there they can have infertility, right? But not all the patients of SLE. Yes, showing thus, that is the answer for you. Right, now, yeah, so we were, uh, we were discussing this question actually. Right. So, primary extraglandular Jogren syndrome is seen in all except. Right. So, the answer to this particular question here is, okay, so I was getting a mixed answers. Some of you are answering rheumatoid arthritis, some of you are Raynaud's phenomena, some of you lymphoma and some of you splenomegaly. Right. But let me tell you what exactly is the answer. It is the rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, it is not the extraglandular manifestations in Jogren syndrome. See, actually, what is Jogren syndrome? It is the keratoconjunctivitis sicca, right? Where you have glandular manifestations. Right? Where you have glandular manifestations, where there is involvement of the salivary gland. And there is also involvement of the lacrimal gland, right? Involvement of salivary gland and as well as the lacrimal gland. That is what will happen in patients with the Jogren's, okay? Now, apart from this, there is also the extraglandular involvement. And what is that extraglandular involvement in Jogren's? These are your extraglandular involvement. That is, arthritis will be there, but not rheumatoid arthritis. Remember that very, very important point, right? Raynaud's phenomena can occur, renal tubular acidosis can be seen, vasculitis can occur and as well as lymphoma also can be seen. So these are your extraglandular manifestations in patients with the Jogren syndrome. But rheumatoid arthritis, it is not the extraglandular manifestations in patients with the Jogren syndrome. And even splenomegaly, that is also one of the extraglandular manifestations of your Jogren syndrome. So answer to this particular question here is rheumatoid arthritis right then i just show you a very important question related to your this uh, jogrens you answer this question let me see who will answer first yes uveoperatitis is seen in systemic lupus erythematosus jogrens syndrome rheumatoid arthritis sarcoidosis
Right. So, any other answers? Mehtab has answered it as sarcoidosis. Okay. Any other answer? Very good. So, all of you are answering it correctly. The answer to this particular question is the sarcoidosis. No, it is not systemic lupus erythematosus uh, showing us. The answer is the sarcoidosis. Now, what do you understand by this word uveoparatitis? This is nothing but your Heerford syndrome. Right? This is nothing but your Heerford syndrome. Okay. Now, in uveoparatitis, there will be involvement of your parotid gland. Right? There will be parotid gland enlargement. But how do you think that there will be parotid gland enlargement? The parotid gland enlargement will occur secondary to secondary to accumulation of non-caseating granulomatous material. Right? Secondary to accumulation of non-caseating granulomatous material. You understand that? That is what is your Heerford syndrome or uveoparatitis which is seen in patients with the sarcoidosis. Now, the point is, how will you differentiate now? Even in Jogren syndrome also, there is parotid gland enlargement. Even in patients with the uveoparatitis also, there is parotid gland enlargement. Then how will you differentiate? The very important differentiating feature is the biopsy. Right, the very important differentiating feature is the biopsy. Now, what is that you will see in the biopsy of a patient with the uveoparatitis? Because it is secondary to sarcoidosis. What is that you will see in sarcoidosis? You will see in the biopsy as the presence of non-caseating granulomatous material. But what is that you will see in the biopsy of the Jogren syndrome then? See, Jogren syndrome is an autoimmune disorder. And these antibodies, that is anti rho anti-LA, they are being synthesized by the lymphocytes. So in the Jogren syndrome biopsy, it will show CD4 plus lymphocytes. Right? It will show the presence of CD4 plus lymphocytes. So this is how you will differentiate Jogren syndrome from the uveoparatitis which is being caused by the sarcoidosis. Right? Now, now let me show you a last question in this discussion. Right. Granuloma is a pathological feature of all except giant cell arthritis, microscopic polyangitis, Wegener's granulomatosis, Churk-Strass syndrome. In which of the following pathological conditions you don't have granuloma formation? <laughs> Uh, it is unpredictable, Sherry, whether AIMS will be postponed or not. Right. Very good. So, everyone are answering this greatly. So, the answer is microscopic polyangitis. So, in microscopic polyangitis, you will not have granulomatous inflammation. Right. And you take giant cell arthritis, Wegener's granulomatosis, Churk-Strass syndrome, and as well as even in Takayasu, Right? Even in Takayasu, you will have the granulomatous inflammation. So, four types of vasculitis where you have granulomatous inflammation is giant cell arthritis, Wegener's granulomatosis, Churk-Strass syndrome and as well as the Takayasu arthritis. Okay? Right? Sorry, Takayasu arthritis. Whereas you take in case of microscopic polyangitis. In case of microscopic polyangitis, the type of inflammation what you will have is necrotizing inflammation which is nothing but your non-granulomatous inflammation. So, in polyarthritis nodosa, Kawasaki disease, microscopic polyangitis, Hinon-Schollins purpura, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, cutaneous leukocytoplastic angitis, in all of these conditions you will have non-granulomatous vasculitis. Okay, right. So, thank you Ravi Kumar. I am very happy that for that. Right. So, this completes the discussion on the questions related to connective tissue disorders. Right. So, this is for today. Right. So, thank you for all those who have attended this particular session. And tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. we have another YouTube session of test and discussion. So I welcome you all for the tomorrow session which is going to be conducted at 5.30. Right. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow again.